in the 15th century, the century of sail, empires for the first time expand across oceans. China sends out huge fleets, but recalls them on the brink of world domination. In Italy, wealth and ostentation create great art in the Renaissance. In Mexico, the Aztecs build a city of blood in the middle of a lake. The Ottomans conquer Constantinople and call the Mediterranean their own. From the fringes of Europe, sailors cross oceans and stumble upon the rest of the world. A thousand years of history. Millennium. In the 15th century, the world's richest seas were dominated by Chinese ships. Here in the Philippines, pearl divers still come across evidence of their journeys. They find porcelain, decorated with images of mythical beasts. One plate shows the huilin symbol of good luck. The search for this fabulous creature prompted some of the greatest voyages of discovery. In 1415, the Chinese thought they had found a real Huilin. It made a guest appearance at a banquet in the Forbidden City. It has the body of a deer and the tail of an ox and a fleshy boneless horn with luminous spots like red or purple mist. It walks in a stately fashion and its every motion observes a rhythm. Its harmonious voice sounds like a bell or a musical tune. Captured in Africa, the Huilin was a giraffe. The emperor commissioned expeditions to foreign parts to gather intelligence and demonstrate Chinese superiority to the world. They did it by a crushing display of sea power. The first fleet to set out had over 300 ships and nearly 28,000 men. Each voyage lasted two years, visiting 30 countries around the rim of the Indian Ocean. The Chinese reached as far as Mecca in the north, Zanzibar in the west. 
It has even been claimed they reached the Southern Ocean and Australia. The enterprise was led by an admiral of legendary presence and charisma, Zhong He. He stood seven feet tall and five feet wide. He had swarthy skin as rough as an orange, and his eyes sparkled like light on a fast-moving river. The emperor chose Zhong He because he was an outsider, a Muslim and a eunuch. In an inward-looking court, he was an imperialist who looked beyond China. Compared with European vessels, Zhong He's treasure junks were giants. They were the largest wooden ships ever built. Over 400 feet long and 180 feet wide, they were powered by bamboo sails on nine masts that could be set to any angle of the wind. At the stern were the compass room, admiral's quarters and galley. Down below were the crew, animals and cargo. The ship was kept afloat by 13 watertight compartments. Each could be flooded separately and used as a fish tank or a washing area. This technology was 500 years ahead of the West. It was used in the building of the Titanic. The navigators checked their latitude by measuring the angle of the sun and stars to the horizon. In plotting their course, the sailors already understood the difference between true and magnetic north. They had a method for measuring the speed of their ships kept time by using calibrated joss sticks. Zhong He wrote, However far the seas and lands beyond the horizon, their distances can be reckoned, their routes recorded. The details of the countries he inspected were recorded by his surveyor, Ma Huan. The coastal towns are full of rare spices and beasts that evoke a sigh of admiration. Everywhere we went, the natives looked with longing on our gracious gifts, felt our transforming power, and duly presented their tribute. Rubies, lions, pearls the size of plums were all given to return to the central country. Traces of these expeditions remain. Zhong He has a type of ginger named after him. A tablet in Sri Lanka records his visit. On the west coast of India, Chinese fishing nets still grace the entrance to Cochin Harbour the last relics of a time when Chinese technology ruled the seas. <laughs> Zhang He's voyages marked the beginning and the end of Imperial China's seaborne exploration. By 1430, Politicians persuaded the emperor to abandon global ambitions. Barbarian kings, wrote one scholar, should be treated like harmless seagulls. The bureaucrat's advice was, the outside world has nothing to offer China, leave it alone. The naval effort was halted and never resumed. Zhong He was recalled and ordered never to return to the sea. 
To obliterate his memory, his records were destroyed. Today, Zhang He and his great enterprise are virtually unknown in his own country. For most of the 15th century, Western Europe was in recession. But in Florence, bankers and merchants found a new kind of wealth to acquire. Art, inspired by ancient Rome. Their investment created a reborn civilization the Renaissance. Rich patrons vied to give Florence a style and skyline to match their civic pride. The architect, Brunelleschi, designed a dome for the cathedral that would do just that. Florentines imagined their town as the ideal city, perfectly laid out in accordance with God-given rules of proportion. But what drove the city was money. In politics, cash bought votes. Big spending bought prestige. Bankers charged 45% interest and soon became as powerful as warlords. The women of Florence wore their wealth on their sleeves. Their cloaks were embellished with silver and pearls, enameled flowers and gold leaf corals and 800 peacock feathers. Officials policed the streets for those wearing too many buttons and furs. They had little success. The family that outbid all others to buy power was the city's biggest banking dynasty, the Medici. They were the ultimate political party givers. <laughs> Only Florence could entertain the Council of Churches of East and West in 1439. The Medici bankrolled Successive heads of the family ruled the town as though they owned it. They used methods recommended by their advisor, Niccolo Machiavelli. It is far better to be feared than loved if you cannot be both. One can make this generalization about men. They are ungrateful, fickle liars and deceivers. They shun danger and are greedy for profit. While you treat them well, they are yours. The Medici treated their artists very well indeed. They collected them as objects of power and influence, paid them lavishly, and reveled in their genius. The measure of an artist's genius was his ability to find beauty in nature. Ferma così. 
Everything nature produces is regulated by the law of harmony. And her chief concern is that everything should be perfect. Without harmony, this could hardly be achieved. The critical sympathy of the parts would be lost. Proportion should govern the parts so that they may give the appearance of a body perfect. Florentine artists created ideal forms, an idea of beauty the West has inherited today. Bianco. In such a fashion-conscious society, artists were expected to dress up old religious themes with a new and personal twist. Members of the Medici family were painted into key roles in sacred scenes, dressed in the height of fashion. And these fabrics didn't come cheap. Florentine merchants spent as much on a single outfit as on a large townhouse. A set of brocade wall hangings could cost more than a country estate. Artists across Europe were paid high prices to make textiles look real. The highest paid artists were those that achieved the illusion of reality. A painting's value depended on the colors it contained. Before the artist touched the canvas, a contract was drawn up stipulating how and where each color was to be used. The most expensive of all was ultramarine, made from lapis lazuli, found only in Afghanistan. Then there was Kermes red, made from crushed Turkish spiders. Orpiment orange from the mountains of Bavaria. Burnt sienna, yellow ochre. While the world arrived on the artist's palette, the exploration of that world began with man. The human form was the measure from which the wider world could be constructed. To understand nature, Leonardo da Vinci examined the intimate workings of the human body. His approach was an engineer's. He designed fortifications and guns. He imagined parachutes. But his dominating obsession was flight. Science is the captain, practice is the soldier. Those who fall in love with practice without science are like a sailor without helm or compass. The screw creates a helix in the air that rises rapidly. From the discovery of man, Renaissance curiosity turned to the discovery of the world and, in Leonardo's case, to the sky. The ideas of the Renaissance spread. People began to think the same way and wear the same look. Today, Renaissance aspirations survive in the desire to create beautiful objects and possess them.
Mexico City is one of the biggest, busiest cities in the world. 500 years ago, another great metropolis stood here. The capital of the Aztec Empire. It too sustained a huge population. 8,000 dancers performed in its main square. Today, it lies hidden inside the modern city. The Valley of Mexico was full of the ruins of great civilizations, which inspired the Aztec builders like Teotihuacan, the kind of city the Aztecs wanted to create for themselves. The site of their city was chosen by the gods. They were led there by an eagle. They found a nest strewn with bones. The place of the cactus and the stone Tenochtitlan. The first Europeans to see it were awestruck. When we saw the city built in the water and that straight and level causeway leading to Tenochtitlan, we were astounded. These great buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, seemed like a city made by a sorcerer. In the marshes outside the city, the Aztecs raised gardens. In this environment, 7,500 feet up, they could not grow all the food they needed. Yet their markets were full of produce. They sell honey, wax, and tortillas. Gold and silver, lead and tin, embroidered goods, and slaves. All this wealth was generated by one activity, war. The Aztecs forced tribute from every land they conquered. armor, jewels, and the elite food, chocolate. 32,000 bushels of cacao beans arrived each year to be drunk by the city's nobility and priests. Aztec recipes mixed chocolate with honey and nuts, chilies and blood. To maintain this vast robber empire, they needed to nurture warriors. Children were expected to fend for themselves and faced tough discipline. Disobedient girls were made to inhale chili smoke. Boys were pierced with cactus spikes. The Aztecs renewed their world by fire and kept the sun in the sky with blood. Their gods demanded human sacrifices to ensure the continuity of life. The Aztecs fought to take captives whose blood would feed the gods. Prisoners knew their fate. Death was considered an honor. There is nothing like death in war, nothing like flowery death so precious to the giver of life. My heart yearns for it. To inaugurate their great temple, 
Some say 80,000 were killed. After the sacrifice, all well smeared with human blood, all the young men and women dressed up in garlands and danced to the beat of the tambour. The piles of skulls were a warning to their enemies and made the Aztec Empire one of the fastest growing states in the world. In the spring of 1453, the skies over Eastern Europe darkened. Constantinople, for centuries the center of Orthodox Christianity, was besieged. The story of the city's fall is still told by Turkish puppet masters. You know how difficult it was to capture Istanbul. Thousands of people died on both sides. Let us now close our eyes and imagine how it happened. The walls and ramparts of the city were a thousand years old. They were all that protected the Christians from the Islamic storm that now surrounded them. The Ottomans. Their army was 100,000 strong. It was led by a 21-year-old prince, Mehmet Khan. In the middle of the night, Mehmet launched the final assault on the ancient walls. The Christians were outnumbered 14 to 1, but they withstood the onslaught till dawn. Then a small group of Ottoman soldiers swam up a sewer and raised the flag on the battlements. Thinking all was lost, the Christians retreated and the besieging army flooded over the ramparts. The Byzantine emperor died in the fray. Mehmet entered the city on a white horse and rode straight to the church of Hagia Sophia. The Christians had taken refuge inside, looking to their god for protection. The Ottoman soldiers exacted a terrible revenge upon the city that wouldn't surrender. Priests were decapitated as they celebrated Mass. Women were butchered where they knelt. Young boys and girls were violated on the altars. Seeing the carnage, Mehmet wept. He ordered the destruction to end. The church became a mosque the cornerstone of his new capital. Today, Turkish poets celebrate Mehmet's life. Tarihlerde destanım var, hem şerefim hem şanım var. İnsanlık ayı pahaya biçtim, insanlık ayı pahaya biçtim. Doğruyu gerçeği seçtim. Mehmet rebuilt the city on charity and tolerance. The empire of the world, I say, must be one. To make this unity, there is no place more worthy than Constantinople.
Attached to each new mosque was a soup kitchen, feeding 10,000 a day. He encouraged people from all nations to live in his city. In just 80 years, the population rose tenfold. Christians, Jews and Muslims lived side by side. This tolerance was embodied in his treatment of the whirling dervishes. Mehmed built a prayer hall for this wandering Muslim sect and here they worshipped God through music, spinning themselves into ecstasy. At the center of the city, Mehmed built his palace. I give orders for the erection of a palace on the point of old Byzantium. It will leave nothing to be desired, a palace that should outshine all in looks, size, and gracefulness. From this epicenter, the Ottoman Empire grew. Straddling Europe and Asia, their realm soon stretched from the Danube to the Euphrates, following rich trade routes. These roads carried an Ottoman obsession, food. In the vast kitchens of the palace, the cooks were challenged to invent new dishes. From the corners of the empire, produce came. Aubergines from Persia, oranges from Jordan, dates from Egypt. And a new exotic bean arrived from Yemen, coffee. You roast the beans in a pan. You cook them yourself. They come from plants a long way away. Denied alcohol by their religion, Muslim merchants valued coffee's stimulating properties on their journeys across the empire. To the lands they conquered, the Ottomans brought peace and a new prosperity. But amassing a huge land empire was not enough for Mehmet. He wanted to rule the sea. Mehmet struck against the greatest naval power of the age, Venice. In a series of sea battles, his fleet pummeled the Venetians into submission. By the end of the century, the Ottomans had turned the eastern Mediterranean into an Islamic lake. In the 15th century, Portugal and Spain stared out from a corner of Europe over an unexplored ocean. Their coasts were the very edges of the civilized world. The land was poor and the people jealous of their rich Mediterranean neighbors. They looked to the sea. Traditionally the domain of monsters and serpents, the ocean now became a place of opportunity. Here, at Sagresh, on 
the southwestern tip of Portugal, adventurers gathered around the prince, now called Henry the Navigator. They struggled to make a living from piracy and slave trading, but imagined themselves as something grander, knights of the sea, heroes of the romantic fiction of the day. In the classic adventure, the hero starts life as a poor son. He sails across the world, duels with giants and monsters, marries a princess if he's lucky, and ends up ruling some enchanted island. This fairy tale spurred the discoverers to begin their exploration of the world. They hoped to finance their fantasies with the gold of Africa or the spices of the East. Spices gave flavor to food and status to a rich man's table. Merchants and kings hired geographers to work out new routes to the countries where they grew. At every stage of the spices' long journey to Europe, taxes were levied. They passed through the hands of countless middlemen who ensured inflated prices. From this, it is to be understood that very great quantities must grow in the East, and it need not be wondered that they are worth with us as much as gold. In search of wealth, Portuguese navigators sailed south to Africa along dangerous coasts which rivals feared. Beyond was a green sea of darkness where a ship would stick fast in gelatinous slime, loathsome monsters hovered in the depths, and men turned black beneath the scorching sun. Each expedition ventured a few degrees further south, meticulously mapping out the coast of this new land. They marked the limits of their exploration with a cross, a challenge to those who followed. The Portuguese navigators hugged the coast of Africa until they reached the greatest obstacle of all, the Cape of Storms. In 1488, it was rounded and renamed the Cape of Good Hope. The navigators had reached the edge of the Indian Ocean. But the currents and winds were against them. They could go no further. In Lisbon, a weaver's son had another idea, to head west into the Atlantic Ocean. His name was Columbus. And travelling leagues, you will reach the most fertile of lands, abundant with every type of spice and precious stone. I call the location of these the West, although commonly it is said they are found in the East. To get official and financial backing for a romantic adventure, Columbus needed a hard-headed plan. He scoured books and maps. He argued that the Eurasian continent stretched halfway across the world. The coast of Japan, he thought, lay in the middle of the Atlantic, in the path of winds which no one had yet followed. If he could get there, he would become rich.
Columbus's decision to sail with the wind was revolutionary. The Portuguese navigators had always sailed into the wind on their outward journey, knowing that this same wind would blow them home. Columbus hoped that the Atlantic winds traveled in a circle. He would sail west, believing winds would eventually swing north and carry him home. It was a gamble that paid off. He made landfall in the Caribbean on the 12th of October, 1492. Columbus sought to prove that this mysterious new land was an island off the coast of China. He claimed he saw fabulous beasts from the east, dog-headed men and griffin's footprints. 6th of November, 1492, I heard great numbers of birds, all different from those of Spain, except for the nightingales, who entertained us with their songs. But his desire to find the East had blinded him to reality. Nightingales are not found in the New World. Columbus is remembered today as the discoverer of a new continent. Six years later, Vasco da Gama changed the world more profoundly by discovering an ocean. He found winds that carried him successfully around the Cape of Good Hope and beyond, into the Indian Ocean and to the spice ports of the East. His journey destroyed the Arab stranglehold on the spice trade. Three years later, 150 tons of spices arrived in Portugal. Atlantic was Europe's highway to the world. New sea routes had been opened up. In the next century, Europe's commerce would shift to its extremities, to Lisbon, Seville, and cities with access to the wide oceans, linking the old world with the new.